Now you'll notice some of the plants I have uh, have roots attached. While the roots are edible, I generally don't eat the roots because they're not as nutritious. They're loaded with uh, carbohydrates and sugar. They're often a pain to pick. They're very woody, not very tasty to eat. And they also kill the plant. So for, for your sake and the fact that I just have way too much of this in my yard, I pulled it out. No, and you, you just be aware that you can eat the roots, although generally I prefer to eat the greens. Let's do this. Everybody feel free to grab a leaf. We're gonna study it together. Can we eat a piece? If you want to, this stuff's clean. I still don't know what it is. All right, so this is called common mallow, and it's an okra relative. Okra, have you guys heard of that, that vegetable from the south? So if you try a piece of this, do it at your own risk. I know it's clean, but you don't have to eat it. I'm not forcing you. You'll notice that it has similar gelatinous qualities to it, right? Kind of like okra. That gelatinous quality helps to bind smoothies. So if you make green smoothies and they separate, you could throw okra in them or common mallow and it'll help keep it smooth. I'm going to do an experiment. Is this better or is yeah. it funnel it? Yeah? <laughs> this is my 50 cent microphone. <laughs> Alright, so one of my uh, wild edible teachers, her name's Karen Sherwood. She runs wild edible camps out of Washington. She says the best way to learn a plant is to take some time to study it, which you guys are doing now. It's in your hands. Tell me some ways that you will remember this plant. Little white flowers. Shape of the leaves. What's the shape of the leaves? Yeah. There you go. Somebody said buttons. Tell me about these buttons. You see these little buttons? They're call, uh, another common name for this plant is buttonweed because it has these tiny little buttons. Are those not where the flowers come buttons. out? Yeah, they, they are where the flowers come out. So the whole plant is entirely edible. Entirely edible. Another, they used to actually use this in the cheese making process. They'd grind up a bunch of these buttons and it would help mold everything together. And the buttons are actually really tasty. They taste quite a bit like okra. That they pick the and uh, back in the olden days, they used to make cheese out of, like, use it in the cheese making process where they'd use that, that sticky, slimy con consistency in the, the process. What else do you notice about the flowers? They're white. Okay, what little else? Purple stripes. Purple stripes. And do you also notice that they have little clefts? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah? yeah. So the petals have a little indent that's known as a cleft. All these things help us to identify common mallow. What's, is there any There's no benefit medicinal? to it. Nothing medicinal. I'm totally joking, of course. <laughs> Full of vitamins and minerals. Last spring, I was sitting on my computer and I was compiling nutritional data about wild edibles for my iPhone app. And what I learned is that wild edibles are good for everything, that greens are good for everything. And basically what I found was that for every single green plant that's in the app, there were four to 10 pages of nutritional data. I'm not gonna even try and summarize it all, but I'll tell you real quick that all greens are anti-inflammatory. So for example, if you have inflammation or abscess or any kind of infection, greens will help solve that. They help alkalize your body, so if you're too acidic, they help solve that. All greens are going to lower blood sugar, stabilize it, so if your blood sugar is too low, they'll bring it up. If it's too high, they'll bring it down. Loaded with various vitamins and minerals. Malva in particular is really good for the heart. So if you have uh, any kind of high blood pressure, that going on, malva, common mallow will be good for that. And I'll point out certain little uh, 
things that I remember in particular, like when we see other plants. But in general, I just want to re you guys to remember that greens are good for everything. I know it sounds really broad, but it's true. So who has this growing near them? I got it in my garden. All don't pull it out. Don't pull all of it out of your garden. This is another green that you don't have to buy. Yes? So, if you were to use this, would you use mostly the leaves, the stem? If you wanted, could I throw that in a smoothie with my fruits? Is this a leafy? Totally, yeah. So if, you, if I were to use this, more often than not, I just go through and take the tender greens, throw them in a salad uh, the, or a smoothie or whatever. The flowers are really beautiful in salads. When I first met David Wolf, he actually invited me to stay at his house for a week. And we just sat around. We take slices of avocado and wrap them in the leaves because they get pretty big. Sprinkle them with lemon juice and they're like little gorilla wraps, I like to call them, right? <laughs> and then the buttons, if you can, you know, they're actually just fun as a trail side nibble. You can just... Yeah, totally, of course. Hey, something I might want to say to piggyback on what you've been saying is that a lot of people pick their weeds and take them out and spade them right into your soil. They grew for a reason like that, and they actually add the minerals and everything and bite them back to your soil. Yeah. You spade them right in there. So there's another book by Michael Pollan where he talks about how certain plants actually get humans to give them an environment that they like. Like, for example, corn is one of those plants, right? Corn in history had so many carbohydrates, so much energy, that humans chose to cultivate it over other things. And so in a way, like corn has been manipulating us, right? It worked. It, it worked, worked, right? <laughs> we eat corn and everything now. Well, weeds also know that, for example, it's really hard to compete with trees or other plants. So when you dig up your garden and disturb the soil, you'll likely find many edible plants right there in your garden, many edible weeds that prefer the easier environment. So what I, I do personally is when I go to plant a garden, when weeds sprout up, I let them grow a little bit to see what they are. And often it's purslane, lamb's quarters, common mallow. And I leave you know 40 to 60% of those in my garden as additional food. Sometimes if they're overtaking the garden, I actually transplant them somewhere else. I have big uh, wine barrels that are cut in half for weeds, kind of contains them. And that's something you might want to consider if you're a gardener, to just let them grow enough to see what it is. Moving right along. Have you guys seen this guy? Nope. <laughs> okay, we won't tell you. I just picked one of those this morning out of my garden. It's mustard green. Nope. No. Nope. It's called prickly lettuce. And it is a dandelion relative. Prickly lettuce is actually lettuce's first relative. So if you buy romaine lettuce at the store, at one point or another, thousands of years ago, it actually existed like this. The thing is, if you try this, it's bitter. And I think humans noticed that at some point and they, they decided, hey, I want something a little bit more pleasant. So my theory is that somebody somewhere noticed that one variety of prickly lettuce was sweeter than the next. And they started cultivating those seeds. They'd always take the sweetest seeds and plant those. And over time, they all found that they can make things sweeter and also bigger, so you have to work less to get more. And over time, they hybridized a lettuce that has big, broad leaves, tastes super sweet, and mild. The downside to that is hybridization is kind of like inbreeding. The genetic potential gets lowered. So when you eat something like prickly lettuce, you're getting a lot more nutrition than you would from romaine lettuce. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't ever eat romaine lettuce because it's good for so many things. <coughs> what I am saying is that this is going to be much more nutritious than the lettuce you buy at a store. One great identifying characteristic, and I'll pass a couple more of these leaves around. Well, first, you, you guys said it already. It looks like a dandelion. Mm -hmm. Dandelions have many relatives, no poisonous lookalikes. 
So if you eat something you think is a dandelion and it's not, okay. still going to be healthy. That's good information. Right? Thank you. One, you guys that have a leaf, what can you tell me about the main vein? It's got little spines. Right? They're kind of tough, actually. They're a little bit woody. And it's a mohawk hairline. Right? Everybody can see that? That's what tells me that it's prickly lettuce. It looks like dandelion. And has woody spines. Now, if I were to eat this, I might get pricked a little bit, right? But if I have a Vitamix, I can blend it no problem, and that's just extra fiber. Also, the smaller the green, the more tender and more nutritious it is. So if you get the leaves when they're small, they're going to be full of even higher nutrition, and the, the prickles are going to be very soft and won't be an issue. You can use this, throw it in soups. I don't know what your guys' diet is, but if I were you, I'd pack wild edibles into everything. If you eat omelets, throw the wild edibles in those. If you make sandwiches, throw wild edibles in those. If you make salads, throw wild edibles in those. Just get them into your diet. Prickly lettuce. Does it bloom or have flowers if you let it just go on? It has uh, similar like dandelion looking flowers. It also has a milky sap and oftentimes I've heard this fallacy that the milky sap is poisonous. Completely not true. It's bitter and that bitterness actually helps to cleanse your inner organs. We don't get enough bitters in our diet. Bitters stimulate bile production, they aid digestion, and it's not a taste we even like anymore because when this competes with like a jelly donut, of course we're always going to eat jelly donuts. But on the flip side of that, you know, this does your body a lot more good than a jelly donut. All right, I just have like five more and then we'll start our walk. So this is a dandelion, right? Again, we have the root. All parts are edible. Traditionally, the root has been dried and roasted like a coffee substitute. You can actually get it online if you're trying to kick the coffee habit. Dandelion coffee is really good and there's no caffeine. It's good for your inner organs. The flowers are incredibly delicious. I don't know if you've ever done that, but you could actually take a flower and, and they're sweet. One thing I like to do is pack these flowers into a jar of honey or agave if you're vegan. Let them sit there for a couple days. It makes this awesome like marmalade that you can go spread on crackers or toast and it's wild flower infused. I don't know about you, but in Missoula, we have just fields of dandelions, enough to go around. People just don't know what to do with them, but I eat them, throw them in smoothies, salads, honey. One sure way to tell that something is a true dandelion is based off the main vein. So we just felt on the prickly lettuce that it had a mohawk hairline, right? What does this vein feel like? Smooth. So, where? Oh, yep. There you go. So, if it's a smooth vein, dandelion, 100%. Now, this is a Montana dandelion that I got there. Likely today we'll see other ones that are more lobed. This one has sharp jagged teeth, right? In French it's called Dent de Leon, tooth of a lion. Doesn't matter if they're lobed or sharp, if the stem is smooth, if it has a dandelion-like flower, you can eat it 100%. I mentioned putting it in pesto. The bitterness in dandelion uh, complements a pesto. For some reason when you mix it with some kind of fat, either nuts or oil, it's just, just a great combination. So you can eat the dandelion easily, and it makes the pesto taste better. <laughs> totally. This is one thing I haven't seen here at Cherry Hill, but it's likely all around. This is a type of wild mustard. All wild mustards are edible. It's one of the biggest families. I think there's 40,000 different types of mustard. Mustards include broccoli, cabbage, kale, 
arugula, one easy way to identify a mustard is by the way that it smells. If you crush up a leaf, you should be able to smell slightly mustard-like scent. So you could just, well, just pass some of these leaves around. I would say you have to be careful because we don't want to go just off looks alone. We want to engage some of the senses. And that's why I think that smell is such an important taste, or smell is such an important sense, is because often our eyes can be deceiving. But when you crush it up, it kind of smells peppery, like mustard. Spicy. Yeah. Spicy horseradish almost. The other thing is if we had a magnifying glass, all mustards have, the flowers have four petals and six stamens. Stamen are the little, um, like little tentacles that come out of the flower. Two of those stamen will be short and four will be long. So if we're getting really technical, four petals, six stamen, two short, four long. That's great in salads, man. Just spice up your salad. Who wants a little flour? There you go. Say that again. I know it's dangerous for cows, but okay for humans. Tansy is uh, more like on the medicinal side, so you don't want to eat too much of tansy. But I know it kills cows. In Oregon, they used to, to pay for full of bucket tansy. Again. It's good to be cautious, but cows will graze and eat 40 pounds of it. So if you ate 40 pounds of spinach, you'd probably get a stomach ache too, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> Does the stem run dandelion? Yeah, totally. All right, if I was a wild edible superhero, this one, this little plant would be on my tool belt. Wild spinach? Take a leaf and uh, pass it around. This is called plantain, right? Broadleaf plantain. And the reason it's called broadleaf is because it has nice, big, round, oval leaves, right? Today we'll see long leaf, lance leaf plantain, just another variety. Who's heard of psyllium husk? What is psyllium husk good for? <laughs> Cleansing your colon, right? <laughs> Did you know that plantain produces psyllium husk? Plantain has a seed pod that comes out that produces up to 22,000 seeds per stem. Each one of those seeds is coated with a husk. They grow certain varieties of plantain, harvest the husk, and that's what you are sold as psyllium. So if you eat plantain greens, <coughs> they're good for your digestive system. Now, plantain is also an amazing plant for bug bites and bee stings. First time I met my girlfriend, I was showing off and I was doing a handstand in the grass. Of course, I didn't have my shirt on. I rolled, landed on my back and landed on four bees, not just one, but four. And I got stung, right? Luckily, I knew that plantain discharges bee stings. So I went around, I crushed some up, I chewed it up and actually spit it into her hand. I was like, will you please rub this on my back? <laughs> I knew she was a keeper when she stuck around after that. What you'll find is if you get stung, chew it up, apply it, within 15 minutes the pain will go away and the swelling will go away. Author Janice Shawfield, there's a great book out that she put out, it's called Discovering Wild Plants. She talks about people curing blood poisoning with it. She talks about how her father actually treated a gunshot wound once when he wasn't able to get to a hospital. This plant can literally save your life. And it's also really high in protein and super nutritious. What was that book we'll, we'll pass it around. Discovering Wild Plants by Janice Shawfield. I don't remember the last book, Canada, Canada Northwest. Yep. Okay, okay, now plantain is super easy to identify because it has these nice parallel running veins. And this never works when I'm trying to demo it, but if you rip the stem, hold on a second. Let's see, can I just borrow your leaf real quick? So yeah, if you rip the stem, it's just like celery leaves. It has thick fibrous threads in it, yeah? 
Yeah. And then lastly, how come there's a plantain banana? Yeah, and a plantain. Yeah, that's that's the problem with common names. You know, people just name things differently. Anybody know what this is? It looks kind of like kale. I'll give you a, a hint. Curly is in the name. Curly Doc, you got it. Can you guys think of why it's called Curly Doc? Because the leaves start to ruffle kind of like kale leaves, right? Now this is another great plant for bee stings. If you ever get a nettles rash, for example, as you become more advanced at foraging, you can actually juice or chew some of this dock, apply it to your skin, and it will reduce uh, the itching from nettles. Very high in chlorophyll. It's really great for urinary tract infections. Tons of iron in this one. Curly dock. And the easiest way to identify it, apart from the leaves ruffling, is the second year growth. Yep. Nope, it's not related to burdock. The one that's coming out May 13, May 2013, my wild edible book will be out. Fresh has a dock in it if you have fresh, but it's very limited, the wild edible stuff that's in there. So the second year growth of dock looks like this. Sometimes when I say, listen to your plants, people think I'm crazy. But often when dock seeds go to seed, they're covered with this husk that'll actually rattle in the wind. So when I was hiking on the trail sometimes, often I'd hear dock before I'd see it. And if you just crush some of these leaves, maybe pass them around, these seeds are actually amazingly high in omega-3 fatty acids. The seeds themselves, the... Um, well, no, I actually throw these in crackers. Would you eat these? I wouldn't eat these. These I picked uh, close to a road, so I'd say no. But basically, you can see that. And this is the curly dock? This is the curly dock. Dried up. Can anybody tell me something that will help you remember the seeds? I like it. Say it louder. It's got three sides. It's got three sides. So you, if you look really closely, you'll see that the seed is actually in the middle of the husk, and the husk has like three sides. It's triangular. So they're really tiny. It's like chia seeds, right? Yeah. They're kind of like chia seeds in there. So yeah, they're a pain to, um, yeah. <laughs> to peel. So I just throw them in with the husk because it's extra fiber. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, that said, let's go hiking. So. If you're ever stranded in a survival situation and you forget everything else that I say, remember you can chew on grass to get vitamins, nutrition, and energy. It's pretty tough and fibrous and you definitely wouldn't want to do it here because there's a lot of foot traffic. But if you're out and about, you can actually harvest grass, bring it home and blend it in your blender. You can uh, juice it like wheatgrass get similar health benefits and if you're out in the field just chew it extract the juice and spit out the pulp because it's, it is very fibrous but it's a, it's a great survival food but you won't really digest. all right so we have uh, malva or common mallow what we looked at and then this right here is also called uh, pineapple weed or wild chamomile and I think the reason why it's called pineapple weed is because it has these tiny little pineapple-like flowers. And if you crush them up, it actually smells kind of fruity. So chamomile or pineapple weed is going to have calming properties. So if you put them in your salads or green smoothies or soak them in honey like the dandelions, it's going to be a nice thing to, to get in your system before bed. It'll help you sleep and relax. And it's just a very nice fruity taste. And you wouldn't ever think that a green could taste that good. You could smell it. I wouldn't eat it from here, again, because there's lots of foot traffic. 
but it's good to know about. This guy right here. And again, your sense of smell helps you to identify it, right? That's a pretty unique smell. Anybody didn't get one? Yep. All right, let's keep going. There are some plants we definitely want to learn to stay away from. This is one of them. This is poison hemlock. And people are different, like sensitive to it in different ways. Some people uh, react just by touching it. I know that I don't, so I'm handling it. But the leaves kind of look like parsley a little bit. The stems get purple and they have these little purple dots. That's a great way to identify hemlock. Sometimes people confuse it for wild carrots because they do kind of look similar. That's why I generally don't teach people about wild carrots. If you know what to look for, it's actually really easy to identify and differentiate the two. Wild carrots have a fuzzy stem whereas hemlock is totally smooth. And then wild carrots or Queen Anne's lace have a tiny little black dot in the flower. I would say as beginning foragers, just don't eat anything that looks like a wild carrot. And remember, purple stem and little purple dots, splotches. Maybe, I don't know, if you feel comfortable handling it, just don't lick your hands afterwards. Nope. Or there, it could get red, kind of red, but there won't be purple dots. The other thing that many foragers forget to mention is edible trees. Most common tree varieties are edible. Like for example, maples, the young tender leaves taste quite nice in salads. They actually have that sweetness that uh, comes from maple syrup. So they can be quite sweet. All evergreens are edible. They have uh, conifers, or sorry, they have pine trees, dug firs, spruces and cedars. They're very good for taking phlegm out of the body. So if somebody has asthma, drinking tea made from pine needles is going to be very beneficial for them. Or cedars, you're saying? Even the green? Yeah. Oh. And hemlock trees as well. So all yeah. conifers. I always thought hemlock trees were poisonous, but it must have been the plant. The, the plant hemlock is poisonous. The tree hemlock, you can use the needles. In the springtime right now, we'll actually see some. They have young tender tips, light green color, right? They're very tender, they taste lemony, you can actually throw those in salads. Uh, you can use them to clean your teeth if you forget your toothbrush, they actually strip sugars off your teeth. Uh, if you're pregnant or breastfeeding, not recommended that you eat evergreens because they've been known to affect uh, toddlers, fetuses, and uh, pregnant mothers, not so good. But for all other purposes, they're healthy. <laughs> all right, so over here we have lance leaf plantain. Same thing I talked about by the car, but the leaves are going to be long and narrow. Same identifying characteristics with the parallel veins. You can, uh, it's growing all through here. Just wanted to point that out. And also when we're talking about wild grasses, we have all these different varieties. The reason that wheatgrass got so popular is because it's a, it comes from a hard winter wheat that produces a lot of juice and grows really fast. It's not by any means the most nutritious type of grass. So if I were just hiking through the trail, what I would do is I would yank on the top and it, it would expose these light green tips. And if you feel them, they're quite soft and you could just and it's a little small snack that gives you a little bit of carbohydrates, a little bit of sugar. It's a good trail side nibble. You just kind of yank on the, the stem and it, it should squeak out. The other thing that it accomplishes is it actually helps to spread the grass because you throw that part, you've just spread its seeds. So you're being a good ethical naturist. Let's continue. We also have a wild rose variety here. And the thing about roses, the saying is, a rose is a rose is a rose. 
So it doesn't matter if it's cultivated in your garden, they're all the same. And they're all edible, believe it or not. Rose leaves have a lot of iron in them. So they're, again, really good for women, really good for people that have hepatitis or uh, a low red blood cell count. They actually taste to me a little bit like Granny Smith apples, which ironically have a lot of iron in them also. The leaves, the petals of the, uh, the rose actually are edible. You can throw them in salads. Now you don't want to do it with genetically modified roses or roses that have been sprayed necessarily. But if you have organic garden, you can eat those petals. They also make trail side band-aids. So you can just lick the petals and stick them onto your wound. And uh, there's actually enzymes in the rose and oils that will help seal the wound. You can feel free to try one of the leaves. Since it's not growing on the ground, I'm not as concerned. Just a quick note, I wanted to show you these guys. And you can feel that they're much less, uh, they're really soft. And they smell a little bit lemony. You can just feel it, or they're super soft. This is what I would actually throw in my salads. You know, I'm still learning all my pines. Yeah. I'm thinking it's, uh, like a fur? yeah, like a fur. Okay. So any of the pine needles are okay then? Yeah. None are toxic or anything? It's not a pine because pines have really long needles. Like this would be a pine. So it would be like a, a fur. So any fur or any pine is fine? Yeah, totally. And any spruce too. So spruce would be more like a, a pipe cleaner, but they have a lot more needles than this. Yeah, basically. Also, in the springtime, like now, the pine trees, you'll see, they'll develop these little seed heads that will start pollinating. You could put a bag over the pine tree tip and shake it into the bag, and the pollen will fall, and that's just pure protein powder. Yeah, so you could actually throw it into um, in smoothies, yeah. If you get seasonal allergies, might not want to do that. So right here we have more or less a medicinal plant. It's called Oregon grape, you're correct. I can't hold it and talk with both hands. So right now it has yellow flowers, yeah? And those flowers can be used in salads. You don't really want to eat the leaves because they're kind of like holly. They're sharp and they're tough. As we move into fall, they'll turn into uh, actual purple berries. And traditionally those were used in wine making or jams and jellies huge antioxidant content which is of course good for uh, getting rid of cancer i'll tell you a little personal story i once went to a health expo in toronto it was like the be the biggest in the world and there it was a trade show with tons of different supplement companies and this one guy would just not leave me alone you got to try my supplement uh, most people have 30,000 uh, antioxidants in their system you need 70 to be uh, happy or healthy and I was like, sorry, dude, I don't take supplements. And he just wouldn't let me go until I decided, until I let him take my antioxidant level. He had some way of measuring. I rated off the charts. I had 150,000. And he was so shocked because it literally went off his chart. He was like, all right, what do you do? <laughs> Oregon grape has a ton of antioxidants. And this is one of the few roots that I actually use. If you ever have a toothache, or a headache uh, and you need a little bit of pain killing properties you can just chew on this root or use it in tea and then the berries of course I'll throw in salads because it'll give them a nice little uh, salt sour taste and the flowers are really nice too but you can kind of see if you peel the bark the root is really yellow it's kind of like turmeric, and what is turmeric good for? Anti-inflammatory, your joints. So if you have arthritis, guess what? 
You don't need to go to India. <laughs> See how yellow it is? Will you say that a little bit louder, please? The root of Oregon grape could be used in place of golden seal, which is a very, very expensive herb. So this is a nice way of getting those products. Yeah. You know, speaking of pain relief, that chewing it, mm -hmm. doing that, is there a certain amount that would be toxic, or is it not really? Again, you'd have to... Experiment? You'd have to experiment with your body. The question is, would there be a certain amount that would be toxic? See, when, when humans invented aspirin, the origins of aspirin came from like alders and willows, right? If you, you need to eat like a pound of willow bark to get the effects of one little aspirin, it's so heavily concentrated. So there's really no worry for me, like if I have a toothache and I am chewing on Oregon grape that I'll ever get enough to where it'll harm me. Uh, and plus it's all natural substances, whereas aspirin has synthetic man-made stuff in it so I would just say start with a little and progress as needed can everybody see this plant right here anybody know what it is kind of looks a little bit like corn good so there are about uh, 10 poisonous plants in North America that you should be aware of poison hemlock is one of them this is the other biggest poisonous plant. It's called false hellebore. Native Americans actually used to juice this and poison their arrows with it. So you really just want to look at it and not have too much contact with it. It's rare that I get to point this out to people because it usually grows near water and I've never really seen it on a guided wild edible hike. So you guys are lucky. It looks like corn. The leaves are alternate, which means that they kind of alternate up the stem. They don't grow symmetrically from one another. And as the season progresses, they're going to start uh, getting tethered, tether, like ripping, kind of like palm fronds when they blow in the wind. So don't eat false hellebore. False, false hellebore, yep. Yeah. The other thing that's right above of your head is pine trees, right? And these are these little catkins that I was talking about. They're like little baby pine cones. They're kind of soft. Not the tastiest meal, but you can process them. They have carbohydrates in them, which means energy. Calories in nature are a good thing. Only when we live in a society where calories in our, our vast abundance and easily accessible do we freak out and we're like, oh, calorie means an extra pooch, right? If we all lived in the forest, our mission every single day would be to go eat as many calories as possible. So while we may think, oh, okay, well this is silly, like I would never eat pine cones. I probably wouldn't either, but in a survival situation, if I was really going hungry, these would provide my body with calories. Good to know about, right? I, I hope there's no end of the world, but if there is, we might as well prolong it a little bit. We're gonna make our way up this path and then we're gonna dip down into a gully where there's tons of miners, lettuce and other stuff. So while people are catching up, I just wanna say that a couple people have approached me and said, wow, these tastes are really intense. And I just wanna reiterate the fact that uh, we've kind of hybridized our food to taste very mild. The only intense taste that we ever really experience is are sweet and salty. And maybe you try wild edibles and you think, oh my goodness, like this is not realistic for me to ever eat this. This is gross. And to that I just say, give yourself a chance. Don't decide right away whether you like them or not. If anything else, it's just adding more taste to your diet. And here in the field, you know, we might be eating like a little pine cone and you might be thinking, wow, never. Mm -hmm. But then as with the dandelion pesto example, if you work it into your culinary cuisine, you might be surprised how awesome it is. Essentially, wild edibles offer you a taste that nothing else can provide. So, as when we start new things, it takes time to get accustomed to it, just allow yourself. That doesn't mean you have to eat tons of it, just periodically revisit it.
the other thing I want to mention is when people think of foraging, sometimes they think I'm going to go on a hike to the most pristine area and it's going to be full of food and I'm going to eat there. How many people have ever thought that? All right, I'm the only one. But that was my initial reaction. I was like, oh, I'm just going to hike in the mountains. It's going to be super beautiful and abundant. Boy, was I wrong. The reason that many pristine areas look that way is because there's no food there. Do you think that we are the only species out there that eats in nature? No, bears, deer, little rodents, they eat way more than we do. And if you ever come to a place that's like breathtaking, there's no trails, it's because there's no food there. Versus you come to a place like this where it's like overgrown and there's tracks and, and holes and stuff, it's because there's food and people and people and animals, probably more animals than people, come to eat. So it's just kind of interesting to think that it really is nature's garden. You know, it will ne there will never be an abundance of plants where it's totally shaded and very little sunlight because just like a garden, it's hard for little plants to compete with trees. Often wild edibles like to grow near water, near streams. And that kind of narrows your uh, frame of reference for where the most abundant area will be. <clears throat> this plant I'm not super familiar with. I think it's called hound's tongue. I believe it's medicinal, so I won't talk about it that much just because I need to learn more about it. We have thistle here. I'm not going to handle it because it's very spiky. Believe it or not, thistles are totally edible. If you have nice heavy-duty gloves and a knife, you can actually pick the thistle, peel the stem, the bottom couple inches, and it'll taste just like cucumber. It's going to be very rich in water and uh, very delicious, right? When we were hiking through deserty areas, sometimes we would actually run out of water, and during those times we'd eat cactus and thistle for water content. Probably the, the most delicious wild edible, I think, is what this gentleman's holding. It's called miner's lettuce. So miner's lettuce got its name because back in the day, miners used to eat it. It's very rich in vitamin C. It has uh, 90, milligra 90 milligrams of vitamin C per cup. And so it's, it's just very good at, for that. So. Maybe we could just tread lightly up the hill and everybody see if they can identify, find a miner's lettuce. It has round disc-like leaves. That'll be your uh, impromptu little quiz. This cottony one right here is called mullen. This is a medicinal one. It's used for uh, repairing respiratory system like asthma, cough, phlegm. Don't juice this in smoothies. Don't put it in your juices or smoothies. It's too medicinal. You'll have a negative reaction. Feel it. Yep, it's fuzzy. And it'll grow a huge seed head that's going to be about this tall. Brownish, yeah. Somebody said it, Indian toilet paper. It's, you know, nice and soft. However, be aware that the Amish uh, we'll actually use it as makeup because it's slightly irritating. So if you rub it on your cheeks, it makes it rosy. So be aware that you might have rosy cheeks elsewhere if you use it as toilet paper. Traditionally, the leaves are dried and then they're used in tea and that's what helps the asthma and stuff. Uh, there's a couple other plants I want to point out right here. There's this one, it has a super square stem and it kind of compiles on top. This is a mint relative, it's called henbit. Henbit. Yeah, and it's kind of like a wild herb. You'd use it in small quantities like basil. Just the leaves kind of. Just the leaves, yeah. It has really pretty flowers when it's flowering that is really nice. But the one I'm really after. This is the one you're talking about there, right? Yep. And that's all edible. It's all edible. 
So all mints have square stems, right? You can kind of feel that. That's yeah. the hen bit. H-E-N-B-I-T. And you can see that it has the structure of a traditional mint where it has uh, opposite leaves, which means they grow symmetrical, and it has these little flower clusters close to the stem. Everybody see that? Hen bit. Now this is why we use our nose. Is that the same? Yep, the same as this. Yeah, okay. So this is not hen bit, but go ahead and crush that up and smell it. Crush that up and smell it. Here, I'll pass that. Oh yeah. pledge? Crush it up and smell it. Lemon <laughs> Well, that's edible, right? Yep. Crush it up and smell it. Crush it up and smell it. Uh, no, this one doesn't. <laughs> oh, this is different. This is actual <laughs> mint. <laughs> but this is a nice mint patch. We have lemon balm and we actually have mint here, all of which have square stems and they're in the mint family. I challenge you to find some. Easy, it smells like lemon. Here, there's a huge patch right here. Yep, they're both mints, but. This is the same kind of mint you just had? Yep, smell it. Yep, yeah, that's lemon balm. This is the other kind. Right here. Yep. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Who else? So they look similar. They yeah, they look very similar because they're both mints. Yeah. Okay. Not sure. Yeah. I won't, I won't any. Mints. All mints, you guys help soothe the system so if you ever get an allergic reaction whether it's from wild food or not eating mint will soothe your body like if you break out in hives which you hopefully never will eat some mint lemon balm hen bit regular mint so this right here is called balsam root arrow leaf balsam root to be specific and it was a huge native american staple and if you can't tell, it's actually a sunflower. Sunflowers are part of the aster family, huge family of plants. I believe it's the second biggest. And all sunflowers are edible. And if you smell the flower, it actually smells like sunflower, kind of. So the tender leaves can be used in salads. The root has been dug up, and it's pretty starchy. The petals are really good in salads. And it's really uh, prolific in these parts of the country so I just wanted to point that out let's make our way back to the car I'm starting to lose my voice I'll answer a few questions and then we'll uh, release you into the world